worship. And I want to say special thanks to Sophia. She's playing for me on tonight. It's spring break. Yay, the children get a break. Uh, also, New Beginning Church will celebrate 29 years. On Sunday, we will have our 29th church anniversary. So we thank and praise God for that. Our scripture for tonight will come from Psalm 146, verse number one. And it says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I'm going to say that one more time. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. And the song says, praise him. Father God in heaven, in Jesus' name we come, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity. God, we thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, for another chance to read your word, to study your word, to invest in ourselves through your word. We ask you to bless your word now, Father God, that your word will fall on good soil, that life will be made to differ, will be made much better, that life will be as such that we will lead others to Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask you to bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus is worthy. He's worthy to be. Yeah, he's worthy. Yes, give him glory. Yeah. 
Yes, Lord God is worthy. He is worthy of all the honor, all the glory and all the praise. Thank you, Miss Sophia, for being our maestro for tonight. Thank you so much for for being our maestro for tonight. Won't we thank God for Sophia? Amen. 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 Thank the Lord. We want to invest in young people that young people will make a difference in the world in which we live. Amen. Amen. We thank God for for young people. Thank God for young people. Let's look at first John chapter two. In the New Testament, the book is first John chapter two It's where we are. First John chapter two. We'll be starting with verse 12 and we'll see if we get to 17. We may stop at 14. But we're looking at 1 John chapter 2, verse number 12. It's where we will begin tonight. Don't let me forget to give you an assignment for, for, for tonight, for next, next Wednesday. We will have an assignment. We will be dealing with the flesh, the eye, and the pride. We'll be dealing with the flesh, the eye, and the pride. So your assignment will be to, to find some things that you're dealing with that deals with the flesh, the eye, and the pride. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. I think young people are even, de well, I know young people are even dealing with the flesh, the eye, and the pride. Remember, we said that Jesus was tempted by lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He was tempted that way. Eve was tempted, lust of the eye, lust of, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Adam was tempted. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So when we, when we look at 1 John chapter 2, um, John writes to the spiritual saints, those who are on one accord. He called them the little ones. What we did, we, did we discover about the little ones? What, when he says the little children, what, what is John really saying? Who is he talking to? Little children. Those new in the faith, good guess anyway. But he also talked about, he also called them as the born ones, the born ones, the ones who have been born by Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're looking tonight at 1 John chapter 2. We realize that we begin this chapter by saying, my little children. Now, is he talking to them and saying my little children because he gave these are his biological children? No. How you know that? You don't think these are bi John's biological children? He's talking to those that are born again, right? They are saved. They are born again. They are his. They're, they're not his children, but they are children of God. So he's talking about those who are children of God. If you look and you listen very closely in the world, the world will say that we are all children of God. Is that correct or not? We are all children of God. The world, the world would say we are all children of God. Is that correct? Yes? No? Maybe so? Those people who are not saved, they would say we all are children of God. Are they correct? It all depends on your definition of children. So they are correct, right? So, so we are all children of God. We were all made and created by God. But when John, when the Bible talks about the children of God, who are they talking about? The talking about the saved, the authors of the Bible, the writers rather of the Bible are talking about those who are born again. They are children of God. They are God's children and we are God's children. Right. And because we are children of God, guess what? We have privileges from our daddy. God, the father, we have privileges. Sophia eats stuff that I can't eat at her house. She has a privilege that I don't have at her house. She is special at her house. The whole family revolves around her. You don't believe me? Just watch. When you are children of the most high God, let me tell you, God has set you up for blessings. God is looking forward to you being blessed by him. So when John talks about if a man sin, what is he really saying? When a man sin, because we all sin, right? Even a little bitty baby sin. 
And the reason why we sin is because we have a sin nature. We have the nature to sin. We act out to what's on the inside of us. We have a sin nature. The sin nature, where do we get that sin nature? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve has given us this sin nature. It was passed down from our foreparents. How did they get a sin nature? Anybody else? How did how did they get this sin nature? How did Adam and Eve get a sin nature? Disobedience. Disobedience, right? So when you disobey God, you're in sin. Adam and Eve received this sin nature because they were disobe disobedient to God, right? And so they, they walk around in this sin nature. And guess what? Now we walk around with this sin nature. But we don't have to be guilty of this sin nature. We don't have to be condemned by this sin nature. For, for John says, if a man sin, we have an advocate. Who's our advocate? Jesus. Jesus. What is an advocate? What is an advocate? Attorney. attorney, right? And what does the attorney do for us? Pleads he pleads our case. He stands on our behalf. He, he talks for us. Let me tell you, when you got an attorney, you shouldn't say anything in court. When you have an attorney, that's why you make sure you got a, a good attorney or the best attorney. You remember in the 90s, a brother got up and they had a glove and they tried to put this glove on him. And his attorney said he didn't say it, but his attorney said, if the glove doesn't fit, you have to acquit. If the glove doesn't fit, you have to acquit. Famous for that statement. Who's famous for that statement? The lawyer, the attorney. Who was that attorney? Brother Mal? Johnny Cochran. You see, that's how you get extra points. You just walk in and start talking. You get extra points. So, so Johnny Cochran says, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Let me tell you, our sins are real. We all have sin. We all fall short. We all messed up because of our sin nature. But the good news is when we sin, we have an advocate. We have an attorney. We have a lawyer. And this lawyer pleads our case. This lawyer stands up for us. This lawyer speaks us for us. Isn't that something? The lawyer is Jesus Christ. The attorney is Jesus Christ. And guess what? When you get a lawyer, it's expensive. You have to pay the cost for a lawyer. But let me tell you the difference between the lawyer we get to go to court for us today than the lawyer who paid the price for us. The lawyer that we have, we don't have to pay him. He paid the price for us. Woo, good God Almighty. Make me want to shout on Wednesday. Our lawyer paid the price for us. What was the price that was paid for us? Blood. His blood. How did, how did they get the blood out? He died. He died for us. He gave his life. Did they take his life? No. They didn't take his life? That's what it looked like to me. They, they took him up on a cross and they killed him. They looked like it, they, they took it. But Jesus has laid his life down for us. He did it for us. And if you were the only person in the world, Jesus would have died just for you. He laid his life down just for you. He would have done it if you were the only person on planet Earth. If you were the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you. Isn't that awesome? That is so amazing. That is mind boggling. How many of you would give your children for somebody? <laughs> oh, my goodness. No hands. How many of you wish sometime you would have given? <laughs> so nobody want to give their children up for anybody else. And check this out. God gave his child, his only begotten son, his only unique son for us. And he knew we wasn't going to do right. 
He knew we still were going to sin. He knew we, we were still going to act fools. He gave his life for us. He gave his life for us. He died for us. So when we get to verse number 12, we come with this in mind. We, we come with the thought in mind that Jesus has died for us because we are sinners. Jesus has voluntarily given his life for us because we needed a savior. Not only did he give his life, then he becomes the attorney. He's sitting. Where's our attorney right now? Somebody said, my attorney at home by now. He just probably got through eating. <laughs> Where is our attorney right now? In He's in heaven. What is he doing in heaven? He's still pleading our case. And the only thing we have to do is obey, confess, and obey. Obey, confess, and obey. Because we're going to sin, right? Anybody didn't sin in the last month? Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, but, uh, in thought, in mind. You didn't? I did. I asked the Lord to forgive me. Okay, so we, we need to understand that Jesus has paid it all just for us. Jesus has paid it all just for us. Let me tell you a story. A lady took, a teacher, took some first graders to the hospital on a field trip to the hospital. And one little fella made an observation. This fella asked the question, why is it that the doctors and the nurses just keep washing their hands? Why do they wash their hands over and over and over and over again? They just keep washing their hands. So this wise teacher asked the question to the nurse and the nurse replied, because they love good health and because they hate germs. The analogy here is we must love God and hate the devil. We must love what God has to offer and hate what the devil has to offer. So he paints this picture in verse number 12. He talks about and he talks about the, the spiritual state of mankind. He says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. There's that word, that phrase again, little children. And what do we say that phrase little children mean? Those who are saved, those who are born again. And in this, this particular pericope, he's talking to new converts. So he's talking to those who are saved, those who have been converted, those who have been made over, those who are different. He's talking to them. In this letter, he's writing in this particular portion of the pericope to encourage them. And let me tell you, everybody needs encouraging every now and then. Everybody. How many of you need encouraging every now and then? And let me tell you a secret. Some people need encouraging more than others. Some people need encouragement. Brother Miles too is just sickening. Some people need encouragement until it become what they used to call in the 90s. They used they used to call that the word that you are you codependent. Y'all remember that word? What is, what is codependent? Codependent. I'm codependent. Always depend on somebody else. You, you, you always got to have somebody's attention. And if you don't make it, it's because somebody else didn't give you enough attention. We need to be codependent on no one but Jesus the Christ. We can't be so attached and so dependent on our pastor. Because that joker there, he's just trying to get it right. We must be codependent on Jesus and Jesus alone. So he says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his sake. 
your sins. He's, he's re repeating what he said previously by saying to them, if a person sins, God forgives you. If you confess it, be careful who you tell your sins to. Why? Why we got to be careful who we tell our sins to? Why is that important? Why is it important to be careful? Brother Gavin, why you just don't stand up everywhere you go and just confess your sin to everybody? People gossip. People gossip. People gossip? In your culture too? <laughs> what? I thought that was just in my culture. Really? So they gossip in Spanish too? Ma, ma, ma. I thought they only gossip in English. <laughs> Sophia, do your classmate gossip? What is gossip, Sophia? What is, what is gossip on a, on a child's level? What is gossip? Like whenever someone gets in trouble and then they tell the person, like, don't tell anyone. And then they tell one person, say, okay, don't tell anyone. And then that other person tells someone else, and they say, don't tell anyone. And see what that whole class does. Oh, so they tell everybody. So it's important for us to understand that we all sin. And it's it's almost certainty that we all gossip. Almost. Almost. I'm, I'm almost. I, I think it's probably two people in here that don't. Right. Now, which two it is, only God knows. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Whose name's sake? Who is his? His. God. Jesus. How do we what's the first indication that he's talking about? God or Jesus. When you read that particular verse, it's capitalized. Capital his. Right. Please, ma'am, please, sir. When you're referring to God, never call his name or refer to him with a small letter. Do not write the word God when you're talking about the God in small letters. It must be a capital G. Why is it a capital G? He deserves that respect. Why is it a capital G? You have to distinguish between the almighty God and then an idol God. So you have to distinguish between the God almighty you have to distinguish between the God Almighty. He is the God Almighty. He is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is God Almighty. Isn't that amazing? He is God Almighty. He says, because your sins have been forgiven. God has forgiven your sins. You remember when Jesus made the statement, go in peace, your sin have been forgiven. He tells this woman who was caught in the middle of adultery, go, your sins have been forgiven. And the Pharisee says, no one can forgive sin but God. Why could Jesus forgive sin? If no one can forgive sin but God, why is it that Jesus can do it? Because he's God. Only God can forgive sin. And therefore, Jesus can for forgive sin. Because we know John says in John one that he dwelled among us. To forgive our sins. Jesus was only born to die. He was only born to give his life as a ransom for you and me. He says, little ones, little children. I write this to you to remind you your sins have been forgiven. That is a burden lifted. That is a burden lifted so much just to know you're forgiven. Just to know God has not thrown you away. That's a lifted burden. So he says, my, my little ones, my little children, because your sins have been forgiven, I'm writing this to you. And has been forgiven by Jesus Christ himself and for his sake. You remember when Moses was having this this dialogue with God. <laughs> Moses said, if you kill him, they're going to say you, you, if you let him die here in the wilderness, they're going to say you brought him out of Egypt. 
just to let him die. So Moses was reminding God that God, even you need a good reputation. He reminds God, it's for your sake, God. You need a good reputation. You need to be the one, God, that, that people can look to after I'm long gone. That's why we keep our children in church, keep them in the word, keep them in prayer. Because when we're long gone and some of us going to be gone. When we're long gone, we want them to be able to function on a godly level without us. Pastors have to teach people how to call on God and not call him. Because guess what? He may be asleep. He may be on vacation. He may be hiding. You remember how in, 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 in first Kings chapter 18, you remember how how he, Elijah was on Mount Carmel with 850 false prophets. And they called on Baal from morning to noonday. Elijah said, y'all ought to call him a little louder. He may be on a far journey. He said, you may ought to call him a little louder because he may not be able to hear you. What Elijah was doing, he was emphasizing that they served a, an idol God, a God with a small G, and y'all need to try my God. That's what he's saying. He's saying, if you're Pastor, Pastor Eddie Jefferson back home, preached a sermon from 1 Kings chapter 18, and he used for a subject, if your God is dead, try mine. <laughs> he said what Elijah was really saying, your God may be dead. And if your God is dead, you ought to try mine. So they called on him from morning to noon. They then when it became Elijah time, he called on God and God showed up. How did he show up? Come on now, Bible students. How did how did how did he show up? He showed up in a fire. He burned up the sacrifice. He burned up the bullock. He burned up the altar. And then he licked the water out of the trenches. No one can make fire burn with water but God Almighty. Are you with me? Nobody can do it but God. So for God's sake, your sin has been forgiven. God has promised that he will forgive your sin. So we can't beat up ourselves. We should not beat up ourselves because of our sin. You confess your sin. You ask God to forgive you for your sin. Trust that God has forgiven you and you move on. Because it's the devil's responsibility to remind you of who you're not. To remind you who you used to be. To remind you where you used to go. To remind you where, who you used to hang out with. The devil will never miss an opportunity to remind you. And when he reminds you, you need to remind him. Remind him of where you're going and remind him of where he's going. Are you with me? So we have to make sure that we know that our sins are forgiven for the sake of God, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Verse number 13. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. We're going to see, as we read through these pa this passage, we're going to see how God shifts gears, how, how John shifts gears. He talks to the little ones, then he talks to the fathers. And he has a message for them. He says, because you have known him who is from the beginning. In my Bible, is is italicized says something here. When Moses went before Pharaoh, Moses asked the question, who should I tell him sent me? Just tell him I am. So who God is makes a difference. There's no other God like him. There's no substitute for him. Stuff won't take his place and people won't take his place. Things won't take his place. So he says, you have known from the beginning who God is. So it, it, it looks as if he's talking to to those who 
who are mature in the faith. He's saying now, look, you are, it's kind of like you're saying you ought not be acting like that. You know better. You already know who God is. God has appeared to you from your beginning of your salvation. You have known him. And not only do you know him from the beginning of your salvation, you know him who exists in the beginning. He exists before there was a when or where. He's God. Isn't that something? Who wouldn't serve a God like that? He just is. That's why we ought to celebrate him because of who he is. Even before we recognize him for what he does. I mean, we can lay out things that he has done because he's an awesomely powerful God. But we need to recognize him, first of all, for who he is. He's God. We can't explain him. He is just God. But you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, young men. Is he just talking about Sister Gavan? Is he just talking about men? Is he just talking to men? He said men. Why y'all say he's not just talking to men? If he says men, is he talking to men? Uh uh. Uh uh. Bible students. Is he just talking to men? He's talking to humankind, mankind, right? So the answer is correct. No, he's not just talking to men. He's talking to those who are young in the faith. He's talking to those who, who are still striving. And then he, he draws a parallel to the physical mankind. The parallel is, and you'll see it later on, young men are considered what? Compared to old men. Strong. Young men. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah says the young men going to give out. But those that wait on the Lord. So the analogy here is young men has what it takes to make it happen. But if you're strong in your physical man and you're not strong in your spiritual man, you cannot overthrow the devil. So what's the difference in the physical and the spiritual? He says, because you have overcome the wicked one. Because you've had times where you overcome the wicked ones. When temptation is answered, when temptation is matured, it becomes sin. But he's saying now, let me remind you, you have overcome the wicked one before. So because you were strong in the faith. Because even though you're young, you still have overcome the wicked one. Can you think of a time that you you beat the devil? That the devil thought he had you. And let me let me remind you of what time that was. It's when it looked good. It appeared good. It tastes good. And it was to build your pride up. And you said not today, devil. No, no one ever had that opportunity where, where, where somebody walks in and you, you know they're they coming for you. The devil has sent them. And you said, not today, devil. Anybody? Have you had an opportunity where you really would have just flown off the handle? You really would have given them a piece of your mind. You really would have said some words that you don't say in church. Are you with me? It's that time that you overcame the devil. Or it was a time when you were in the midst of your troubles and you had a choice to cuss it out, fuss it out, or pray it out. Did you have the victory? Yes, Brother Miles, uh, you, just started, you just started speaking in tongues and I'm not talking about holy tongues. 
Can you remember one time mm -hmm. that the devil thought he had you and you just you just was cool, calm and collected? Every now and then. One one. The devil. How many of you know the devil is real? Amen. The wicked one, Satan, is real. It, and, and he doesn't care how pretty you are. It, he doesn't care how much hair you do have or you don't have. He doesn't care how small you are, how young you are, how old you are, how hard you work. He doesn't care. The devil wants you. But you can overcome him. You can overcome him. You you don't have to give in to him. You can overcome him. You don't have to let him let him use you like a dish rag. Some folk make themselves so available to the devil, he just uses them like a dish rag. And they glad about it. They brag about it. Oh, I did that thing. But the problem is you allow the devil to use you. He says, young men, I'm writing this to you because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. He closes out verse 13 by saying, I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. You spent time with him. You you know the father. It's nothing new for you. You have known you have known the father. You've known him. He says, I can speak for you. Because I know you know him. When people look at you, do they know that you know the father? When they when they hear your conversation, do they know that you know the father? When they watch your action, do they know they, that you know the father? Or you've been around them for 15 years and they still trying to figure it out. Anybody? They know I know. Do they know you know the father because you told them? Because you say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I, I, I got this. To, I got got connection with God. Is that if that's the only way they know that, you know, the father, you have missed it. Because one of the best principles of evangelism is lifestyle evangelism. Where you live your life before them. And you can tell when you live their, your, your life before them, sooner or later you hear a phrase like you. There's something different about you. You don't act like others do. And then they have the nerve to tell you, you don't even act like us. <laughs> you don't act like me. Do they know that you're different or do they know because you told them? It's, it ought to be a lifestyle. Where you carry yourself, where you live your life, where you where, where you come across because you have known the father. And if you know the father, you ought to have the father in you and the father ought to, ought to radiate from you. It ought to be a reflection. It ought to be a reflection that people can see. They can see the father through you. Matthew chapter five says we are the salt of the world. We are the light of the world. You don't light a candle and set it on a bush. You you set it on a, a light lampstand or on a hill where others can see it. You can't say the Charles Barkley phrase. I'm not a role model. Because you are a role model. And regardless of whether you want to be or not, people are watching you. People are seeing how you react to trouble, how you react to pain. How you react to suffering, how you react to trauma. People are watching you. And some parents will say, I'm not my children role model. They do what they want to do. Ooh, that's horrible. Because you have known the father, people, people see you and they know the father through you. In other words, when people see you, guess what? They recognize God in you and they act out in front of you because they they are looking at you in determining what God is like. 
or they get more subdued in front of you or they respect you because you are the only image of God that they recognize right now. Do they understand what God is through you? Or are they deceived about who God is? And for little children, for little children, their parents is the best image of God. And guess what? Some of them are tearing up God's character. You had your hand up. Yes, sir. I was going to say, uh, in my apartment complex, there's one young man who I never thought, no, this, because of this action, never thought uh, that he could see that I was a Christian, how I was speaking and stuff. And then one day, someone was in my parking park spot, and he told me, you have to move from that spot. He said, that's what they thought. That's a baby of God. And she always parked in. She's having a hard time walking. And I was just amazed because I had never noticed. I didn't know, you know, because this activity that he had, they respected me. Right. So people respect you based on, number one, where you respect yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, there, there are always some things that I encourage young people. I say, first of all, keep your focus. Mm-hmm. Secondly, remember your purpose. Thirdly, respect yourself. Fourthly, honor others. And fifthly, obey God. Because when you don't respect yourself, you don't demand respect and you won't get respect. You won't receive respect. Girls who are doing it all, showing it all and acting through it all, there's a lack of respect. And that's why men do what they do, because they see that you don't respect yourself. Isn't that something? People base their lives on your life. They treat you based on how you treat yourself and they treat you based on how you respond to God. Says verse 14, I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Didn't he just say that? Why he keeps saying that? Because check this out. Repetition impacts our memory. Why do two year olds know rap songs? I mean, it it gets in your heart. It gets in your spirit. It it, it becomes a part of you. The more you hear it. Why do two year olds know when to clap in church? Why do two year olds know how to praise God? There's one spectrum spectrum and there's a different. They mimic what they see. So he he labors on this. And when I was studying this, I'm like, man, I'm going to have to go to verse 17 in, in order to even talk about something in here. But look at what God has revealed. Even in these short reminders, God is reminding us today to walk for the Lord, to walk in God, to keep living the way we ought to be living. Don't get caught in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person doing the wrong thing. It says folk are watching you and you you've been knowing who God is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong in the word of God abides in you. Remember, I said that young men stand out more so than seasoned men, older men, simply because we look for young men to be strong men. I'm not talking about strong and pumping iron. I'm talking about strong in the spirit of God. So he draws this parallel between the physically strong and the spiritually strong. See, the good thing about God, you can be 80 years old and still be strong. Spiritually strong. God is looking for somebody who would devote themselves to him in order to be strong. He wants to be in your mind. He wants to be on your heart. He says, because you are strong, I write this to you, young men. And the word of God abides in you. 
In other words, the only way to be strong is that the word of God abides in you. A guy went over one of his friend's house in the backyard. He saw two dogs fighting, a white dog and a black dog. They both they were fighting. So he, he's looking at them and he asked the, the owner of these dogs, which one win the fight? And he said, the one that I feed the most. So he says, it doesn't matter if the dog is black or the dog is white. It doesn't matter if the dog is old or the dog is young. If I want the white dog to win, all I got to do is disregard the black dog at food time. What he's saying to us is if we don't nourish ourselves on the word of God, then we are not strong. Deacon Alfred, it doesn't matter if you are a deacon or not. If you don't feed yourself on the word of God, you're a weak deacon. Isn't that something? You're weak. You're not strong. There's a chain on my bike that goes round and round. Round and round. And it, it, it catapults me to the next step, right? But that chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Because if one link breaks, the whole chain is useless. What did I just say about the church of Christ, the body of Christ? What am I just saying? Sister Richard, what did I just say? We are only as strong as the weakest person. The body of Christ needs to be a strong body, but it's not strong until we build up everybody. He says the way we build each other up is through the word of God, because the word of God abides in us. And because that word abides in us, now we are strong. The word of God abides in us. How do we get the word of God in us? Study. study. What's the difference between reading and studying? We're just glossing over it when we're reading, right? In school, in school, teachers said, stop that boy. You just calling words. Read the thing. You just calling words. I want you to read it. I was in high school before I ever figured out what she was talking about. Stop just calling words. When you're calling words, you have no comprehension. When you're calling words, you have no understanding. But when you study. And not just read it. You do have an understanding. I like to use this country analogy. In the country, we had a cow that was right across from my grandmama's house. And you could see that cow reach down in the cross and get a cook. Y'all with me so far? I ain't losing anybody, did I? I know I lost Sophia. She had to ask when to get home. The cow would, would eat, he would put a a cook, a cook in his mouth. And he would eat it and he could eat on that same cud all day long. He eat on it all day long, but he had something that humans don't have. He got an outer stomach in an inner, inner belly. He would he would chew it up and he would drop it down in his outer stomach. Then he would regurgitate it, chew it up again and drop it down in his inner belly. What I'm trying to tell you today is, in order for you to be strong, you gotta drop it down in your outer belly and bring it back up and drop it down in your inner stomach or vice versa. What I'm trying to tell you is, you gotta chew on it just like that old cow. And you gotta chew on it over and over and over and over again in order to be strong, you gotta chew on the word. The word of God has to become priority to you. If the word of God is not priority, you will not be strong. If you make the word of God priority, you will be strong. He says this word of God abides in you. It lives in you. And what's in you comes out of you. It's the word of God. 
The best part of your day ought to be the time you spend alone with the Lord. The worst part of your day will be the time you skip spending time with the Lord. How often should you spend time with the Lord? At least daily, maybe two, three times a day, but very least daily. Let me tell you the only time that you should skip spending time with the Lord, skip what days you need to skip. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you permission to skip time with the Lord. This is the only time you can spend without getting in touch with God. Y'all ready for this? The day that you don't eat, the day that you don't brush your teeth, the day that you don't get dressed, the day that you're not conscious. That's the only day you can not spend. You can afford to skip your time with the Lord. If you're conscious, you have to put your focus on the Lord. So everybody got that day, right? Not just all of these things, but any of those. When you don't eat. When you're not conscious, when you don't brush your teeth, don't take a bath. I, I know during COVID when people were having having uh having work from home, they, they didn't get dressed. And the sad summation, somebody would testify and say, because I've heard it, I ain't took a bath in three days. Y'all saying, uh, 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 it wasn't y'all, was it? <laughs> we cannot afford to not spend time in the word because spending time in the word makes us strong. Look at the last phrase, verse 14, as far as we can make it tonight. And you have overcome the wicked one. Who have overcome the wicked one? The ones who are strong. Who have overcome the wicked one? The ones who spend time in the word. Who has come, overcome the wicked one? The one who meditate on God. The ones who spend time with God. The name of our church is New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church. Did y'all know that? Y'all knew that? That's what the state of Texas says. But our church name is New Beginning Church. Because we don't want to be considered Baptist more than we consider be considered a word church. And then missionary Baptist mean that we all black. Did y'all know that? What an education tonight. So when you think of a missionary, and, and, and you know, you got multicultural churches all over now that are called missionary Baptists. But in the 80s, 90s, 70s, when you use the word missionary Baptist church, it meant that you were going to visit a black church. From day one, I never wanted our church to be a pure black church because there are other people in the kingdom who love the Lord also. Therefore, we publicized the name New Beginning Church. That's why we had a Spanish congregation, New Beginning Church. Because we're looking forward to the kingdom, right? What does the kingdom look like? A missionary Baptist church? An all black church? You sure? Sister Richard, what the kingdom look like? She said, it looks like me. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Can't you see the kingdom in me? <laughs> so, so he says, you have overcome the wicked one. You have overcome the wicked one. Who is he talking to? You move back up those who, are, who God abides in. You move back up those who are strong in the word of God. You move back up those who know God. Move back up those who have known God. You move back all the way to verse number 12. You find out who he's talking to. Those who have overcome the devil are the ones who are strong in the word of God. The reverse is as true. If you don't know the word, you are not strong and you cannot overcome the wicked one. The devil, Satan, Lucifer. Isn't that something? Boy, tonight you ought to go home and read that word. I mean, you ought to meditate on that word. You ought to be just like that old cow. You drop it down and bring it back up. That's why we do two things when we read the word, right? What two things do we do when we read the word? Or before. 
One before and one during. What do we do when we're reading the word? Y'all just start reading, huh? Wherever this Bible fall over, I'm going to read it. Mine fell over in the concordance. So that's not going to do me much good right there. That's not how you read the word. I mean, wherever this Bible fall over, oh, it talks about the concordance. This says that the lack means this and the lack finds is found here. So you can't, that's a bad method, right? So we have, we have daily readings at our church, right? Everybody get the daily reading, right? Everybody get the daily reading. We ought to be reading the word in unison together as a church. And that's the way we're going to overcome the word. And then our daily reading leads right up to the Sunday school lesson. And, and it caps it off. Are you with me? Questions or comments? Little ones, any questions? Fathers, are there any questions? Strong men, strong women, are there any questions? Those who have overcome the wicked one, are there any questions? So my appeal is to those who have never received Jesus Christ. This is an opportunity for you to receive him. Just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead. If you never received Jesus Christ, this is your moment to try him to allow him to bless you and allow him to make a difference in your life. In order for you to go to heaven, you must be born again. You must be saved. The door of the church is open. If you haven't received him, just bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite him into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus name I pray, amen. We believe that if you receive Jesus as your personal savior, you're on your way to heaven. Whenever you die, you will meet God in heaven. If you are wrestling with sin, like all of us are, I want to pray with you, pray for you. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us to hear your word. We pray that you bless us, strengthen us, Bless us to be strong in your word. Bless us to confess our sins and bless us that there will be no shortcoming. In Jesus name we pray, amen and thank God. If you're without a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship, where Jesus is the, the one we focus on. Inbox us and let us know if you've received Christ as your savior. If you turn your life over to Christ or if you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord and we rejoice at the moment that we can give to the almighty God. For those of you who want to give electronically, you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your offering, your tithes, your gifts, you can do so by mailing to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. 77459. Father God, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to give. We thank you for this opportunity to listen to your word. We thank you for this opportunity to live out your word. We ask you to bless every giver. Bless those who are burdened. Bless those, Father God, who are falling short. Bless those, Father God, who 
are to be delivered and have been delivered. We pray, Father God, that you comfort someone from their bereavement. We ask you to strengthen someone as they go through trauma and terrible times. We ask you to bind the wicked one, stay the hand of the devil, put Satan on the run. We thank you now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen, amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, if I, if I be lifted up for the, from the earth, will draw all men unto me, John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.